So hello to each and every one of you and a big welcome. Um, my name is Catherine Lassert and I am a carrier woman of mixed heritage. I belong to the Nadliwaten First Nation and I'm a member of the Caribou Clan. And I am Paul's sister, baby sister and Raven's proud auntie. Um, so uh, connected to the Moosehide family. And I'm just feeling really honored to have the opportunity um, to welcome first Elaine and each of you to this workshop um, on behalf of the Moosehide campaign. Uh, I work with the campaign as the director of education and I'll be um, with you as your workshop moderator today. Um, I'm calling in from the unceded territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations here in Victoria. Um, and I just want to thank each uh, participant in this workshop on behalf of the campaign for attending today's event and for signing up to join us for this enormous Zoom circle. It's super exciting. Um, and my job as a moderator is to uh, provide some housekeeping details. So um, you'll you'll notice that you're, you're each muted, <laughs> forcibly muted. Um, so one of the precautions that the Moosehide campaign wanted to take um, with bringing our event uh, into the virtual space is to be really careful about protecting each of your safety um in the, the experience of this event and so for safety and security um we've created um a one-way feed in the chat so that you can send messages to the moderators um we have a tech support person scott thank you to scott and elaine and i as the co-hosts so we can see all of the chat but you won't be able to see each other's chats um, so I'll be moderating, uh, monitoring the chat for um, your input. And if we run into any complications during the session, um, our team will act quickly to respond, um, to remove anyone who needs to be removed or to offer any additional um, wellness supports, uh, actually, if people are in need of any um, extra assistance. Um, so if you, for whatever reason, you're removed or we run into um, a challenging set of circumstances and you can't message me in the chat, you're welcome to email me. Um, and my email is klessert, the my name on the screen, at mooseheadcampaign.ca. Um, and the other point that I want to make is that we will have about 20 um, to 30 minutes for questions at the end of the presentation. So as questions are bubbling up inside of you during the presentation, please feel free to pop them into the chat and I'll be having a document on the side that I'll be kept keeping track of all the questions so that when we get to the question and answer um, that we'll have uh, a list for Elaine that's ready. And finally, um, at the very end of the session, we will take a few minutes to um, give you an opportunity to give some feedback. So we'll have two questions up on the screen that will invite you to type your responses um, into the chat so that we can have a sense um, for our own impact measurement and our own process um, to join us um, with your feedback and your words so that we have a chance to hear from you. So without saying any more words, I will give a very, very, very warm welcome from the Wissai campaign to Elaine Alec. White has to help, Pahas to help, the lach lach, sink seal, yell me home, chichmala, in chai, squeeze teeth, can eat, can okanak in, sihuatm. Good day, elders, family, friends, uh, leaders, young people. My name is Teeth Kanit, and I'm from the Okanagan and Shishwap Nations. My name, Tithkanit, means standing by water, and it was given to me uh, on the day I was born from my Tama, Elaine Alec. My English name is Elaine Alec, and I am the daughter of the late 
uh, Kenzie Basil, who was from the Bonaparte Indian Band from the Sihuatl Nation. He was the son of Saul and Louisa Basil um, and was chief for Bonaparte back in the 70s and part of the American Indian Movement and Red Power Movement and was partially responsible for the shutdown of the Department of Indian Affairs offices in Vernon, BC in 1974. My late mother is Sophie Alec from the Penticton Indian Band from the Seal Nation. She is the daughter of the late Chief Jack Alec, who was um, married to my Tama Eileen Alec, who is also known as Philemon Francois, who was the daughter of Chief Francois, who is also known as Sarimt, who is the son of Guthbuk Jenten. Um, we are descendants of Palkamula, who um, back in the 1600s had 24 wives. Um, from Washington up into British Columbia. And so if you're indigenous from British Columbia, I just might be related to you. <laughs> um, very proud of my lineage um, and my family and my grandmother, my Tama, for keeping the stories and the language alive in, in, in our communities um, and for our family. Um, I was told to introduce myself like that for a number of reasons. The number one reason is because my elders told me to. Um, number two is because I was told to speak my language whenever I can because there was once a time when our people could not. Um, and the other reason is that when you introduce yourself in that way and you talk about your ancestors and you name your ancestors out loud, it calls them into the space with you. So when I was younger and I had a hard time speaking in public um, and I would get nervous or I felt like I had to share something that was important, but I, I was too afraid to, I was told to call my ancestors to stand beside me and they would help me find the words um, that I needed to say. Um, so I do that for very many, for, for all of those reasons. Um, I'm the proud mom of four children. And so uh, my son, Kyle Alec, um, is, is my, my firstborn. Uh, I also have an adopted daughter, Raven Lassert. You may have heard her opening at the plenary today. Um, my daughter, Phoenix, who is 10, and my youngest son, Teslin, who is three. So I've had children in each decade. <laughs> and it's been, uh, it's kept me really busy, uh, but very proud of all of my children for all of the work that they do um, and all of the beauty that they bring into the world. Um, I'm feeling really emotional today, um, listening to that opening and listening to all of the powerful speakers. Um, I'm just vibrating, my, my body is vibrating. And so I turn my camera off a bit. Um, I have a picture behind me that was gifted to me when I was uh, the Union of British Columbia Indian Chiefs Women's Representative. And they have this painting in the Union of BC Indian Chiefs boardroom. Um, and it's called Three Sisters Transformation. And um, it's in uh, honor of all of the women uh, in the downtown east side. And it was painted by uh, Tanya Willard. And when I completed my three-year term as UBCIC women's rep, this print was gifted to me by UBCIC and Cook v. Judy Wilson. Um, and on my screen, I had this pin that my sister-in-law made for me. Um, it's a red dress pin and it's beaded and it's got uh, sweet grass braided around it. Um, so my sister-in-law, Melody Quay, did this piece of beadwork for me. So I had to grab it um, to give me some strength in medicine because I'm just feeling so emotional and I probably will cry <laughs> during my presentation. Um, so I've got my Kleenex beside me. It's just such a beautiful opening this morning. And when I listened to the last speaker talk about transformation and the magic of transformation and talking about how I believe we can change because I have changed. And when one person can change, a nation can change. Oh, that is my story. I, you know, grew up as the child of two alcoholics. I grew up as the child of two residential school survivors. My mom went to uh, Cranbrook, the St. Mary's residential school, and my dad went to Kamloops. Indian Residential School. And I didn't realize until I was in my late 20s that both of my parents went to residential school. 
And because of all of those things that happened to me throughout my life, I became uh, an alcoholic at the age of 12. And through my experiences and in my life, you know, I've done a lot of things that have caused a lot of harm to other people. I have been violent and angry and manipulative and abusive. And I've been that person who has done harm to others. And through my healing journey and through that transformation and who I am today uh, in a space where I can forgive myself and love myself and share my story to remove that shame and silence from our communities, I know that if I can change, that people can change and to work and to continue to work from that love-based place that um, helps to cultivate safe spaces for other people. So I'm just so proud of everything that Paul and Raven have done to uh, promote this work and to bring this work to so many people across the country. There's 80,000 people that are registered. There's over 200 people in this workshop. Um, I am just so blown away by the amount of people who are stepping up to say, we are here to support people. We are here to work from a place of love and we are here to end violence against women and girls. And so, you know, there's so much I could say about that, but I always start off a little bit. Um, so I wrote a book called Calling My Spirit Back. And I started to write that book about 10 years ago. And when I first started to write the book, um, it came from a different place. I thought I was healed. Um, I thought I knew the answers to everything, but I was still very angry. Um, and I was still very much in a place of criticizing, condemning and complaining. And so when I read back the words that I wrote 10 years ago, I'm so happy that I didn't finish that book at that time, um, because I don't think it would have been as successful um, as it is today. Um, I needed those 10 years to do more healing in order for me to write that book. I, I felt a sense of responsibility to write this book at the time I did. Uh, in the summer of 2019, I traveled across the province of British Columbia to 12 different areas of our province to talk about missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls um, and a path forward for our communities um, to end violence for, for Indigenous women and girls. And we had really hard conversations. We didn't want to ask the same questions that we'd been asking, you know, what can we do differently? How can we do better? We wanted to take a look at the 30 years of recommendations of the 2000 recommendations that have been put forward over the years um, on what people have said about ending violence and what needs to happen. You know, and right back to the Opal Inquiry where they talked about um, finding systemic bias within the RCMP and, and talking about systemic racism for those many years. And so we, we decided to plan and work from a place where we started to ask the questions that nobody wanted to ask. We wanted to ask the questions that people didn't want to talk about because they said, we can't ask those, we're going to trigger people. We can't ask those, you know, that wouldn't be responsible of us to do that. We can't do that because we, there's just, we're, we don't talk about those things. So we asked really tough questions that people whispered about, like, what do we do when we have a community and someone comes forward and discloses a story of their abuse and that person is in the community and that person is a leader or that person is a medicine person and nothing is ever done about it. We know the people we're supposed to stay away from in our communities, but what do we do to address it? How can healing and reconciliation occur between the people who have abused and the people who have been abused? And we know in many cases in our communities that we're both, you know, that hurt people hurt people. And if we've been abused, sometimes that's all we know. Um, and like Tia talked about this morning, you know, these are people we love, you know, and, and we don't, we normalize a lot of things and don't understand some things, even when they're right in front of us. And so understanding and meeting people from where they're at, what their perspective is, what their experience is. So 
doing that work in the summer of 2019 and talking to over 300 individuals about this and hearing over 2000 stories disclosed to me by individuals over three years, I felt it was, uh, I felt a sense of responsibility to provide some kind of resource to people who began to ask me questions. How do we begin healing? How do we cultivate and create space? How do we ask those tough questions and still be able to take care of ourselves and the people who come into our space? And so I wrote the book as a resource. I wrote a book um, imagining all of those individuals sitting in front of me, asking those questions um, and, and wanting to know what is it that we can do to heal and move forward and cultivate safe space for myself, cultivate safe space for my family, cultivate safe space for my, for my nation, my community, my organization, the land. And so I sat down on December 1st and I said I was gonna write my first draft by uh, January 1st, 2020. And I completed my first draft of my book in 29 days. On December 29th, I finished my first draft. Um, and I was waking up at five o'clock in the morning to write and going to sleep at 11 o'clock at night because I was writing when my kids were sleeping. And so um, we started to move forward with the book and I was going to self-publish it, which is expensive. And then COVID hit and I said, I looked at my husband and I said, should I even do this? We don't know what's gonna happen. What if I don't get any more work? What if we're going to have to look for resources and support to help us get groceries and pay our rent and pay bills? And he said, no, you need to do this. You need to publish this book. And so we used my savings and his credit to self-publish my book. And then uh, Black Lives Matter happened. And they started to, people started to say in Canada, if we're going to talk about Black Lives Matter, we have to talk about Indigenous lives too. Because we've been talking about all of the systemic racism and all of the racism that's in, embedded in Canada and nobody's listening. But when Black Lives Matter, that opened it up because people started to realize that we all had a responsibility to create safe space. And so all of a sudden I started to get requests for interviews and articles and um, you know, people started to showcase my book that had just been published. And so as a self-published author, we're usually asked, uh, we're usually expected to sell 150 books in our career. Um, to have a Canadian bestseller, you need to sell at least three to 5,000 books. <clears throat> and uh, as of today, I have sold uh, over 5,200 books in six months. And um, <clears throat> from this book, I've created a workshop called Cultivating Safe Spaces and a workbook to help people, you know, learn how to do the work that I do, uh, because I know I can't do it by myself. And I know people are just looking for the tools to know how to do this type of work. And so I created um, this half day session, and then I have an eight hour session. Uh, and then hopefully when we can start to gather again, I'll be able to do live sessions with people to get people confident and comfortable in facilitating um, spaces um, that I've, I've learned to create through ceremony and through the teachings of my ancestors. So I talked a little bit about, you know, touched a little bit about on the things that I've done in my life, um, which was a result of being sexually abused from the age of four to 10 in my community. And not just by one person, but by, by many people in my community. And it was something that we didn't talk about because it was happening to everybody. And so I experienced all of those things in my life. And, you know, I started smoking when I was 10. I started drinking when I was 12. I started hitchhiking on the highway of tears when I was 12 years old. Um, and so now realize looking at my life, how lucky I am to be alive today. I, I think about all of those things and all of those hurts that I, I went through because I didn't know how to put words to it. I didn't know how to have feelings. I didn't know how to talk about those things that had hurt me. 
and then realizing I was able to stay alive because I had the voice of my grandmother in the back of my head. Because when I was growing up between the age, between being born and six years old, a majority of my time was spent with my Tama, who was a language speaker. She only spoke the language. And she told me protocols and things to do when I was a little girl. And she would tell me bedtime stories every night. And she would rub my back. And she would tell me these stories, these creation stories, these coyote stories, all of these stories that put self-love into me. They were stories that told me I was significant. They, to they were stories that told me I was important. I had an identity that I belonged, that I had purpose. And so even though I got to the place where I didn't feel those things, I knew those things deep inside. I knew those because my grandmother told me those things over and over and over again, the first six years of my life. And, you know, my, my mom would tell us, and we, we've done this with all of our children, that the day that we're born, they come into the world and our elders hold on to us. And they tell us, they give us our name and they tell us, you are so important. You are so loved. This is who you are. This is who your family is. This is the land you belong to. You know, we're so grateful you're here. We waited for you for so long. And those are the things that our babies and our children were told over and over and over again. And can you imagine the kind of world we would live in if all of our children were told those things over and over and over again through these stories and through these teachings, through those things um, that talk about self-love. And so what I wrote and the, the workshops I created are based on those stories that I was told. And so one of the stories that my Tama would tell me, she would say, she would talk about the story of the four food chiefs. And so I'm going to share that story right now, because that's what my book is based off of. That's what my work is based off of, is our four food chief story. So before there were people, there were animal people. Animal people roamed the earth. And the creator came one day to the four chiefs. There was Chief Black Bear, who was chief of all things that walked on the land and flew in the air. There was Chief Spring Salmon, who was chief of all things that lived in the water. There was Chief Saskatoon Berry, who was chief of all things that grew above ground. And there was Chief uh, Bitterroot, who was chief of all things that uh, grew below ground. And on the cover of my book is Chief Bitterroot. Um, and Chief Bitterroot represents the female energy and relationship. Um, and it's a really significant uh, plant uh, and medicine to me because when I was a little girl, we would spend time out on the land uh, digging bitterroot with my tama and my mom. And so uh, the creator came to those four chiefs and said, there's going to be a being that comes and you have to figure out how to keep that being alive. And so the creator left the being between the four chiefs and left. And the chiefs looked at the being and they said, this is the most pitiful excuse for a being we've ever seen. It's born with no fur to keep it warm. It's born with no teeth to eat, no claws to protect itself. How are we supposed to keep this being alive? And so the chiefs looked at each other and they talked about it for a really long time. And they finally looked at Chief Black Bear and they said, well, you're the oldest, you tell us what to do. And so Chief Black Bear sat there and thought about it and said, I'm going to lay my life down for this being. Everything that I am, it can have. It can have my meat, it can have my fur, it can have my claws, it can have whatever it needs to keep itself alive. And so all the other chiefs agreed that they would do the same thing. And so Chief Black Bear said, I'm going to lay my life down now, and you have to sing me back to life. So the chiefs agreed. Chief Black Bear laid his life down. And the chiefs came to sing their song and Chief Black Bear didn't come back to life. So all of the other animal people came to sing their song. There was deer and muskrat, coyote, eagle, all the other animal people came to sing their song. And still Chief Black Bear didn't come back to life. Finally, the last being came. 
let me sing my song. I want to sing my song. Everybody was swatting him away. Go on, get out of here. Nobody wants to hear your song. All you do is eat crap and bug people. Nobody wants to hear your song. And it was Fly. And Fly managed to get in and landed on Chief Black Bear's ear and sang his song. And Chief Black Bear came back to life. And what that story tells us is that even the most small and insignificant being, his voice and his song was just as powerful as the chief's song. And that when we take the time to listen to every single voice and every single song, that we are so powerful that we can bring back life. That story is our governance story. It's our creation story. That story tells us how to plan. It tells us how to communicate. It tells us how to listen. It tells us how we're supposed to gather to make really important decisions. And so um, I have a diagram um, that I'm, I wanna have pulled up here. Um, if I can get the, I can share it from my side too. Scott, can you share your screen? Oh, there we go. Oh, no, yes, I can share my screen. So we'll go here. So this um, diagram is based on a nested system. And when I first started doing my sessions, I, I had the four food chiefs on each of the pillars. And I had that story that I shared. And as I started to share, I started hearing people talking about appropriation. Well, I don't wanna share that story because that's an Okanagan story. Or I don't wanna do this because that belongs to indigenous peoples. And I have a very different way of thinking about that um, based on my teachings, uh, based on the things that I was told by my elders, based on prophecy um, and based on um, the story of our four brothers, which are the four brothers who come from the different races, where the creator gives each of those brothers a gift and sends them off into the four directions and tells them to master their gifts. Because one day those four brothers will come back together and they will need to share their gifts with each other in order to survive, in order to live in harmony. And so I was always told that knowledge is no good if you don't share it. I was told that, um, you know, part of our responsibility as Indigenous peoples and as the big brother, that we have to be patient with our little brothers and that sometimes they don't know what they don't know and that it's important for us to tell them how to live in reci reciprocity with the land um, and that it's our responsibility as Indigenous peoples to do that. I come from a family of hereditary chiefs and was told that that was my responsibility. So it might be because I come from that family that that was so deeply put into me, but that's my belief. And so I wanted to create something that everybody would feel comfortable in sharing. Um, I, I took out our food chiefs and I took out references to that uh, because I wanted everybody to feel comfortable in utilizing this process um, that's based on a nested system. And all people from all tribes from all over the world all come from a nested system. Uh, we've all been colonized and it's not just indigenous peoples. And so if you go back far enough and you look at where you come from, what land you came from, you'll see that most likely your people came from a nested system. So in that nested system, you usually see the individual at the center um, and outside of that, the family, and outside of that, the community, and outside of that, the land. Here I put um, understanding self, love-based practice, patience, and discipline, because I believe that there are four necessary conditions needed to cultivate safe space for yourself and for others. And the number one important thing for doing that is understanding self, because as my husband said, and I quote him all the time, um, you cannot create a safe space if you are not a safe space. And sometimes, you know, we, we haven't taken enough time to focus on what our triggers are or what we need to work through. Um, we'd rather work on helping other people so that we don't have to focus on ourselves. And a lot of people who go into helping uh, 
roles are, are often doing that because it's, it's easier to help somebody else than to look within. And so understanding self is number one. And when you understand self and you understand your triggers and you understand who you are, where you come from, what your identity is, and you're strong in that, then nothing that anybody says or does to you will, will impact you deeply. It always impacts us some way, but it won't impact you deeply. It won't stifle your voice because you'll be so confident in who you are that you'll share what's on your heart um, because you know that's your purpose. And then when you're able to do that, you're able to develop that love for yourself. And when you develop that love for yourself, you're able to work from a love-based place or have a love-based practice. Understanding that everybody has purpose, even fly. Fly represents the one who is the bug, the hellraiser, the people who feel voiceless, the ones who we don't like or don't want around. Our story, our creation story, our most important governance story tells us that we have to listen to that voice. Even if you don't like them, if you don't like what they're saying, if you don't like what they're doing, they are still important and we still have to make space for them. And that fly is our teacher. And so when there's people that walk into your, into your house or into your life or into your office and you're like, oh, here we go again. This is a call to open up your mind and your heart to hear their song because they have something to teach. And when you've been able to develop that understanding of self and work from that love-based practice, you can pr practice that real patience, that patience for those people. The, the patience for, you know, other people's perspectives and experiences, even if they're not your own. And when you're able to do those three things, you can practice discipline. And when we talk about discipline, we talk about ceremonial discipline, that ceremonial discipline of witnessing that we were asked to do for the Moose Hide campaign today. They called witnesses to witness this work and to listen really deeply and pay attention to the things that have been said and including the things that are not said. And those witnesses come forward afterwards. And it's really important for those witnesses to listen to all things and hear all voices. And that takes a discipline um, to be in that space. It's like meditating. If you've ever tried to meditate for five minutes to not let outside distractions come in and just meditate, to listen to other people like that. That is a discipline, that is a ceremonial discipline. To listen to somebody you don't like, don't agree with, with an open mind and an open heart and not judge them. Not judge them whether they're right or wrong, good or bad, but just listening to them with a discipline, knowing they have purpose. That you know those things are really important to cultivate safe space because people will feel heard. There have been four things done to people through colonization, four tools used to colonize all peoples. That was to promote sickness and death, to promote exclusion, to promote shame, and to promote oppression. And so in order for us to move forward to decolonize, to move forward and work from another place, we have to think about how are we going to promote well-being? How are we going to promote inclusion? How are we going to promote validation? And how are we going to promote freedom in everything that we do? Colonialism is patriarchal and it comes from a space of fear and control. Our teachings, a lot of our teachings from all over the world, all religions, all come from a place of love. Our, our indigenous teachings from Turtle Island are matriarchal and egalitarian, and they're all love-based teachings. They're ta they talk about love and trust and honoring, whereas patriarchal colonialism talks about fear and control and rules. And so a very simple question I ask myself when I'm talking about myself, making a decision, looking at my family, looking at my business, looking at making a really big decision, um, or responding to somebody, I, I ask myself, is this coming from a place of love or is this coming from a place of fear? And there's so many things that have been ingrained in us through 
school and education systems and rules and policies that are all about fear and control. And we're always worried about making the wrong decision or getting somebody upset, or we're always making our decisions based on fear. And so working from that place of understanding self in a love-based practice where we can make decisions from love. Each of our four food chiefs represents a perspective in our communities. Uh, Chief Black Bear represents the traditional perspective. Those are the storytellers, the knowledge keepers, the corporate memory. Uh, Chief Saskatoon Berry represents uh, the innovative perspective. They are the system, they like to look at systems and find ways to change them or improve them. They're the visionaries. People often think they're crazy because they're so far out there. Tradition and innovation are polar opposites. Um, they often have conflict, but our story tells us that they're important. Uh, Chief uh, Bitterroot represents relationship perspective. They're the ones that don't want to leave anybody behind. They're the ones that uh, will slow down a process because we've forgotten somebody. Chief Spring Salmon represents action perspective. They're the ones who say, we've been talking about this for 30 years. Let's just act on this. I'm tired of talking about it. We need to do something. Those two are polar opposites and often have conflict. And our story tells us each and every one of those perspectives is important. They all need to contribute to our planning, to breathe life into the things that we're doing, and we can't exclude any of them. And so when we talk about these things, we talk about how we need to come together, how we need to understand self, how we need to pay attention to how we're feeling when other people are talking and ask ourselves, why am I feeling that way? Instead of feeling something like anger and then blaming it on them, feeling the anger and asking, why do I feel this way? Where is this coming from? And bringing it inside instead of trying to project it out. So when we can you know, understand each other, practice that love-based um, place, practice that patience, practice that discipline with each other, those are the protocols we put in place to be with each other. And understanding that all of these experiences and all of these perspectives are important when it comes to making decisions, that is how we cultivate that safe space to have really hard conversations. Because once we're able to show up feeling confident in who we are, feeling safe, we move from that place where we're, we may be triggered or traumatized, the lower part of our brain that doesn't allow us to think or focus um, up into the part of our brain that is the um, that is the decision maker, that is the, the solution-based thinking where we can look at things and work from our most power, work from our, our most experience, work from a place where we can be really productive. Um, but when we don't feel safe and when we feel triggered, we're not able to do that. You know, I, I deal with triggering so much in my life on a daily basis and I have to bring myself back and tell myself I'm safe, I'm loved. I'm okay. Um, and if I'm not in that place, I have to step back um, from work and from family and say, I'm not in this space of my brain right now. I'm not going to contribute meaningfully. And I need to step back and somebody else has to step in for me today, whether that's my husband, whether that's my children, whether that's, you know, my colleagues and my work people. Um, and we, we've built a business where we understand that where we're not expected to do everything all the time. And if we have to step back, that doesn't mean we're incompetent. That doesn't mean we can't handle it. Um, it just means we need support at this time. And so we build up a staff that knows that they can ask for that help and not be expected to work when they're working from that place of trauma, because you're not going to be productive at all. You know, when you're working and you're just trying to make it through the day and it takes you two hours to fill out a simple form, there's no point in trying to work. But when you're working from this place where you're loving it and when you're feeling safe and when you're feeling good, you can do 10 times the work in half the amount of time because you're on. And so understanding that those things are happening and especially right now, um, when we're in a global pandemic, how important it is for us to cultivate safe space for each other. Um, understanding that some days we're just not going to be able to do it um, and that that's okay and be gentle on ourselves and to be able to step back. 
um, and to not expect more from others, you know, than, than we should be because we're experiencing a, a communal type trauma throughout the world. Um, and it's getting really tough, especially now because we're just fed up with it. We, we're tired of it. We just want to see our families. We just want to be around each other. And especially now, you know, with being isolated and the amounts of um, the, the numbers that we're seeing for the amount of people that are experiencing violence at home right now, you know, um, just to really pay attention to to what our expectations are of ourself and what our expectations are of other people. To, to when we're able to be gentle with ourselves, we're able to be gentle with other people. Um, and so I think I'm going to start closing that up. Um, there's, uh, there's more information on my website. I think I have a picture of the diagram on my website, elainealec.com. Um, there should be, uh, I'll make sure that it's visible, but I put that there so people can actually download it and print it. So you can use it as a resource for yourself. So I will share those documents on my website. That's www.elainealec.com. Um, give me about a half an hour after we log out of this session and I'll make sure that it's visible and I'll make sure that it's downloadable so that you can print it for yourself and utilize it. Um, and yeah, I think I'm going to stop there. I'm going to hand it back over. I know that we are going to make space to ask questions. Um, so Catherine is going to look at the questions and ask, and then we'll have some time there. And then we're hoping to wrap up uh, about 10 to 12 so that they can ask their evaluation questions. And then I'll gracefully slip out of the Zoom room. Hopefully gracefully. <laughs> Wow. <clears throat> Thank you, Elaine. Thank you for your beautiful spirit and sharing from your heart and your experience. Um, so the questions, let's um, pull them up here. Elaine, do you want me to read out questions and loving comments or just questions? <laughs> All of it. All of it. Great. I love it. So first, we I won't say the participant's name, but um, I just want to say this is amazing. My first experience participating to support the Indigenous population. I am myself part of a minority being Latino and part of the LGBTQ2 spirit population. It starts with each one of us individually, and we are stronger together. Greetings from Montreal and from Costa Rica as well. Thank you, merci, gracias. Beautiful, thank you. Next, um, Elaine, how do you name your parents if they are the source of violence and it is not safe to even say their name? Or if you were in foster care and you do not know who your parents were? That one is such a hard question. Um, some of the work that I did uh, back in my late twenties, I worked for the as an Indigenous youth intern for the province of BC, and some of my work was with the Ministry of Children and Families. <clears throat> and I worked with a lot of uh, Indigenous youth aging out of care, and one of the things that came up all the time was identity and connection. And it's not even just about, um, you know, people who've been removed from their families, but people who've been disconnected from their communities and land, um, people who haven't even been home to step on their home territories. And my husband and I were talking about this on a drive. We go up to the mountains every Saturday and we talked about how can we expect people you know, how can we expect our people to make really big important decisions when we're constantly questioning ourselves and our own identity and we don't feel like we belong. We don't feel like we're part of a family. We don't feel like we're part of a community. And one of the things about the teachings, you know, that our ancestors passed on to us was that we all belong somewhere. And we don't need to necessarily be connected to the people. 
um, but to know that deep inside we're connected to a people and to a land and that is inside of us and that's a part of our blood our blood remembers um, whether we don't remember in our head our blood remembers and if we can find ways to tap into that we can start to remember who we are and and what it is that our purpose is here um, my book starts off by talking about um, before we are people we are light and so we have stories about us as spirits and light being able to see everything and everybody and that when we are light we can see the past and we can see the future and that when we're born into this human world um, we forget that we forget what we saw some people remember the seers like people with those gifts they can remember those things the prophecy people they they remember but for most of us when we're born into the human body we forget all of that but we're told we choose our parents we choose our parents and all of our experiences because all of those things will make us who we were meant to be um, so that we can live our purpose in this world and that was really hard for me to accept because I always thought when I was younger, when I was so angry, I would have not picked these parents. I would have not picked this experience. I would have not allowed myself to be hurt like that. But when I think about who I am today and what I'm able to do and the work that I've been able to accomplish, it's because all of these things that I've been through, even the hurt, even the pain, because every time I was able to learn from it and move through it and feel the pain and heal from it, it made me stronger. And, you know, it brought me to a place where, you know, I feel the fear, I face the fear and I do it anyway. And that was the hardest, you know, I could either let my story and my past keep me prisoner in the past um, and tell myself that I'm no good, nobody loves me, I'm ugly, I'm dirty, I'm stupid because I never graduated, I couldn't get past grade nine, I was a dropout, I was told I was ugly my entire life, I could have lived there and believed it, or I could have found a way to feel the feelings and the hurt and the pain and heal from it and move forward, allow that to make me stronger. Because when we've been hurt, when we have pain, when we've witnessed it, our protection mechanism <clears throat> is to be hard. Our protection mechanism is to put the walls up so no one can ever hurt us. And so we don't feel, I'm too hard, you can't hurt me. That's not gonna happen. I'm not gonna cry about that. I'm not gonna give you the satisfaction. I'm gonna be hard and I'm gonna work through this and be a badass. But when we put up those walls, it also stops the love um, and that those feelings of goodness, those loving feelings to come in because that wall doesn't just keep out the bad feelings, it keeps out the good feelings too. And in order to put those walls down, we have to be vulnerable. We have to be willing to feel the feelings, feel the hurt, be angry about it, cry about it, go through the emotions. But so many times we stop ourselves because we don't wanna go crazy because there's been times where the emotions have been so hard for me that I felt I was never gonna stop crying or I was gonna go crazy. And now as I'm, I'm older now, I'm 43 years old now, I've realized that it does get scary for me to cry and it sucks to be vulnerable, but I now trust myself that I'm gonna cry and I'm gonna cry hard and I'm gonna feel deeply but I trust that my body and my spirit are gonna know how to build myself back up again so that I can be stronger, that there's a reason for this. And I know when you're going through it, hearing that's hard because it's like, it's the last thing you wanna hear about, but Grand Chief Stuart Phillip, when I would go to him and ask him for advice and I just wanna be there, be in that place where I didn't feel horrible anymore, he'd say, you just wanna get dropped in the middle of euphoria. <laughs> just parachuted down into the middle of euphoria and be happy. He said, life doesn't work like that. You have to go through it. You have to go through it to get to that place. And so, you know, for those who are struggling and dealing with those stories and the things that go on in your head, 
um, just to know that um, you're not stuck, even though you might feel like you're stuck uh, and that you're loved. Um, because if I could see you in, in, in front of me right now, I would tell you you're loved, I love you. Um, and, and that you're, you're wanted, you know, and that you belong to some place. And sometimes that's hard for us, but, you know, sometimes we're not going to get that from our families. We're not going to get that from our parents or our siblings or the people who are supposed to be that for us. But that person is why, you know, in your life. And, and there's some kind of teaching from, from that. Um, and sometimes we don't know what it is right away. And sometimes we never might, but, you know, that question, that one is such a hard one to answer. Um, and there's so much more that I could go into. I told my husband I could write another entire book about identity and belonging, um, but that all comes from within. And once we can find that from within ourselves, we don't have to look for it from anybody else. I don't, you know, I, I don't need to have the, the, the love from my dad or the love from my other siblings because I've found that place within me to love myself um, to get me through to where I need to go. Thanks, Elaine. What a beautiful answer. Thank you to each of you for your engagement. This chat is like really on fire. So I really appreciate um, your participation through the chat and your engagement with popping your questions in there. Um, it's awesome. Uh, so one participant said, um, I love how the book is placed in your background. Another one, congratulations, what an incredible accomplishment for the sales of your book. That was from the beginning of the presentation. Um, where or how can I buy this book? I would love to purchase and read it. Um, if you're in British Columbia, my book is in most Coles and Chapters bookstores. Um, they've been really amazing. You can also order it online through Chapters and Coles. They're my number one because they helped me get my book into bookstores. Um, second is Amazon. Um, I still, I, I get the same amount of royalties what, wherever you buy it. So as far as income for me, it doesn't matter where you purchase it from. It just depends on how you feel about that. So if you don't like Amazon, you can also go to your local bookstore and order it and your local bookstore can bring it in for you. Awesome. So next question, you talked about how in, uh, sorry, I clicked off my screen there. You talked about how introducing your ancestors calls them into the room. Do you feel this is specific to indigenous peoples or is this for everyone? I believe it's for everybody. Agreed. I am a settler and teacher in Treaty 7 territory who is struggling with the lack of inclusive practices used by some of my colleagues. What types of resources would you like to see in a classroom for your children? I'm looking for advice as a non-Indigenous teacher. Um, so for my daughter right now, she's in grade four or five. They're actually talking about the Indian Act in her class right now. And my daughter, when they introduced the Indian Act, her, her teacher is great. Um, but my daughter, I have a teaching about governance and she told the four food chief story in her class. And so her teacher asked her to share the story on the intercom. And I, you know, this summer when COVID hit, we found value in it because it was the first time that our family was able to go on the land and gather. It was the first time that our family could go, you know, pick berries and dig bitterroot and go out on the land with my husband. And when we'd go out on the land, we would tell stories to them. You know, this is how we learn things. This is how we learn math. This is how we learn governance. This is how we learn to share. This is how we learn to be a good human being. And all of those teachings that come from those stories. And we were talking about, can you imagine if every young person, it doesn't matter whether they're indigenous or not, if all of our kids were brought out, um, not just on the land, but if they were told these stories every day in school, all of our creation stories, 
um, and from that area. So finding out what those stories are and having an elder or having a knowledge keeper, because you don't need to be an elder to be a knowledge keeper, to come share those stories in your classroom, even once a week, because those stories were put in place to teach us love. Those stories were put in place to give us confidence in ourselves and to teach us how to be a good human being. Um, and all people deserve that. And, you know, I think that's the biggest piece of this is that, you know, reconciliation doesn't mean focusing on the other person. Reconciliation does not mean focusing on the person and telling them what they need to do to fix themselves. Reconciliation is about being responsible for yourself and what you know and what you bring into the space. And sometimes that's really hard. And so we could do all of the work in the world as Indigenous peoples to heal ourselves, but we're still going to deal with the general population of Canada. And all of us deserve those teachings of love. All of us deserve those teachings of belonging and identity and that we're important. Um, because I believe that's where racism stems from. People who don't feel like they have an identity, people who don't feel like they belong and they're fighting for space and fighting to be seen. And so if all of our children could hear those stories on a daily basis would be my favorite to start the morning off by sharing a creation story from where you're from, from that land you're in. I think that would be the most powerful tool we could have because that's how I learned what I learned and why I'm still alive and why I didn't need a grade 12 education to get to where I am because my elders told me these stories every night, every day of my life. And so I don't have a post-secondary education. I don't have a degree. I dropped out of school at grade nine. I do what I do because my elders told me these stories every day of my life. Amazing. Next comment, wonderful presentation. You are inspirational. I will definitely read your book. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us and writing a transformative framework for cultivating healing. Are there resources other than your wonderful book that you recommend to continue the healing journey back to our light? Um, there's, there are so many books uh, that I've seen from so many people who recommend resources. Um, there's a huge community on Instagram that I follow. Um, if you follow certain hashtags, um, like Indigenous literature, Indigenous resources, uh, in, uh, diversity and inclusion, if you follow certain hashtags, people share these resources on Instagram all the time. Um, and as far as personally, um, a transformative book for me that really helped, um, that was just beautiful, uh, was Helen Knott's book. Helen Knott wrote a book called In My Own Moccasins. Um, and that is, I think all Canadians need to read her book. Um, it, she's amazing. Thanks, Elaine. Can we share the online documents with others or just with those attending today? I think that's a general question about the event and the event resources um, more than Elaine's specific workshop. But I think um, on behalf of the campaign, our whole mission is to spread the love and the, the message of the campaign as far and as wide as possible. So there's nothing that's like private towards people registered for today. Elaine, how do you feel about in terms of your particular? resource um i i feel if people feel confident with something and they it resonates with them um and they feel comfortable teaching it to somebody else then i am totally fine with that um it's that trusting yourself right and and it's the taking what you've learned and being able to teach it to someone else that's knowledge and that that's important to share. So if you feel comfortable and confident in that, or you find a way to present it in your own way, then I think that's totally fine. Um, and then if if you do end up reading my book, it's like if you get it on Kindle or if you get the ebook version of it, it's like $9.99 on Amazon to order the ebook version. But in the back of my book, after after you read the whole book at the end, the last chapters go into detail about those protocols and go into detail about the four necessary conditions 
So you could utilize those both as resources um, to introduce to your colleagues or your friends that might want to use it as a resource. Great. Um, do you have tips for supporting someone who is healing from trauma and abuse in either a personal or a professional capacity? Prayer. Um, whenever I have to deal with uh, somebody dealing with trauma in my own life, um, I do a lot of prayer before even opening my mouth. Um, and I will pray uh, to the creator that I stay quiet when I need to. And to remember that I used to ask for a find the right words to say. Um, but I've learned that I also need to know when to be quiet um, and just be there and to validate everything that they're saying and not think that I can fix them. I can't change them. I can't make it easier for them um, because that's my ego speaking. If I think that I have the power to help them fix them, change them, make it better for them. Because if anybody jumped in on my journey, my healing journey, they would have stunted my growth. I had to go through and work through those things in that way. Um, and when I see people, I think, this is what they need to do to heal. I know what's best for them. That's working from that place of ego. And so I pray that my ego doesn't take over when I'm trying to support somebody, that the best I can do sometimes is pray for them and just to be there when they need me and to know what my boundaries are with them because sometimes um, they're not at that place where we, we want them to be or where we think they need to be. Um, and sometimes their journey takes longer than we hope it will. And I think the biggest thing is we start working from that fear-based place that if I don't help them now, they're going to die. And that fear takes over and how we participate in their healing journey. Um, and so that's really hard to do because I've had to do that with family where I knew I had to step back, but I also knew that any day I could receive a phone call saying that they were gone. Um, and if I had been involved, maybe I could have saved them. And I had to change the story I told myself, because no matter what we do as individuals, we can't change that person's journey. We can only provide them with the support um, from our own capacity and what we know. And so, you know, that's a really hard piece. So that's like why we cultivate safe space for others we have to understand self and ask ourselves where we're working from. Are we working from a place of love or a place of fear? And if I'm doing this because I'm afraid for their life, I'm afraid for where they're gonna end up, we might start making decisions that aren't from the best place to help them. Powerful. Um... I'm going to skip some of the loving comments. Well, I don't want to skip anything, but I'm on page one of the comments and questions on my document, and I have all the way down to page four. So I do the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like want to get to the help as many um, people get their questions answered as possible. So um, how's the best way to step back if there's no person to take over when trauma triggers are observed? How is the best, what is the best, sorry, can you repeat that? Way again? to step back. If you feel there's no, no one to take over when you um, observe trauma triggers. So if you're facilitating a space and someone is triggered, how do you step back? I'm guessing we don't have any way to clarify that though. Yeah, I'm thinking um, for myself, like there's so many things that I do um, when I'm facilitating space and we're going to have really hard conversations. When I first started the work, I had a lot of people with like clinical backgrounds and like PhDs and counseling certificates telling me that I shouldn't do the work I'm doing because it was irresponsible because I didn't have the proper training to do the work. Um, and I held back on that work for the longest time because of that. 
but then I realized the way that I host my space is based on ceremony and protocol and that we've been doing this work for a really long time and to trust in those stories and to trust in those protocols and our elders tell us they're I don't know why they call them protocols it's just the way we do things and so you know making space where we do the right thing and so when we're holding space when we follow those protocols for ourselves and for each other it takes care of itself and the other piece of that is when I host circles I'm not the expert I'm not the leader I'm not the teacher we all are and that was the other side that I learned through the work from elders is that we have to stop putting that responsibility on one person we have a communal responsibility to ourselves and each other to hold this space for each other and it's not one person's job to do that and to think that you have the power to take care of everybody at the same time is that place of ego and so you know knowing that when i start my sessions you know creating that space telling those protocols and saying that some people facilitate in a way where one person talks and then you validate them and talk you know talk back with them and and make sure that they're okay and and do trauma informed protocols and exercises to bring them back into the space what i share is that i don't talk until the circle is done even when somebody's had a really hard time because i believe in the power of the circle that people will say what needs to be said um, to help bring that circle to a close and that i'm nothing that i'm going to add to that is like more important than anybody else and part of the protocols is nobody talks until it's your turn including the facilitator and so you know being patient with that and just having trust and faith in that space to take care of itself, trust each other, trust the people that we can do this together and that there's nothing like I have to trust that, that it's I, whatever comes up and whatever happens will be taken care of. And so it takes a lot of preparation, a lot of praying ahead of time before people walk in the room, a lot of praying when I introduce myself and calling my ancestors into the space to help hold that space and inviting people to invite their ancestors in and creating that sacredness of that. So, I mean, there's a bunch of trauma-informed tools that you can utilize, but I always refer back to those teachings of trust and faith and love. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, just trying to keep up here. Um, how do we support creating safe spaces in workplaces? What common triggers or microaggressions might happen invisibly in the workplace? Um, that's the, <laughs> I do a lot of training with, with corporations and, and organizations um, and just setting that space um, with each other and doing weekly check-ins. Um, one of the things that's like, we don't do that and we don't wanna be vulnerable with each other because we're so afraid that we're not gonna be seen as professional, that if we're emotional and vulnerable that we can't do our job right, that's not professional. You need to like put on this front. And so automatically those spaces ask us to leave pieces of ourselves at the door before we're allowed to do the work, before we're allowed to show up. And so we're asking to show up as only part of ourselves. And so to create spaces where we can show up fully as we are, um, I always encourage teams to do weekly check-ins um, at the beginning of the week on a Monday, um, just to take an hour for everybody to do a check-in of where they're at. Because if somebody is experiencing loss or if somebody is, having a really hard time with COVID right now, or if somebody is not feeling well, we can say those things out loud to each other so people know where we're at. Um, and once we have it out there and we verbalize it, and we're also able to ask for what we want, if we can, sometimes we don't even know, but enable, and when we create that space, we create that community of helping each other and understanding that we're human beings 
and that we have human experiences and feelings and those are all important because they impact the way we work and they impact the way we work with each other. And so a lot of times when we don't share out loud or do those check-ins, we start to take things personally, we internalize things and we assume. We assume how that person feels about us because of how they're acting that day, not even knowing why they're acting that way um, and making it all about me. And so when we create that space to do those weekly check-ins, it's a really simple tool to use, is that this is a space for us to share what's on our heart and to ask for help if we need it, I think is the most simple tool I can offer to teams that work together. So there's lots of love popping up in the chat for you, Elaine, and I feel the same level of love just listening to all of your beautiful messages. Um, I think hopefully, do you feel comfortable if we have a time for a couple um, more questions? Is that a good time frame for you? Okay, great. Um, so do you ever have triggering? There's a couple of, of repeats of this kind of same uh, general question. Do you ever have triggering moments when you're with your children? Do you have any recommendations of how to find strength in those moments and to ensure the child feels safe, loved, and sacred? I am still learning that. I, I just wrote something about that today. Um, so I, the one thing when people start filling me with love and telling me how awesome I am, the more I want to share my real life stories about how I'm not. <laughs> and my cousin told me to stop doing that, to just accept the love and not like give their gift away. Um, but I always want to say I'm so human, like I'm so make mistakes, I so lose my temper, I so do things that aren't desirable. And and uh, if they only knew the real me, they wouldn't think I'm so great. But I have those moments all the time. And my daughter is dealing with anxiety. Um, and before I stopped to listen to her, I just thought she was being high maintenance and a brat. And I thought she was just being overbearing and like a diva and just always only wanted what she wanted. And so then we'd start fighting and then it would escalate. Um, and the last two times they got like really close to being violent. Uh, and I remember crying so hard. And this was only in the last few months because of COVID. Um, so it was like five months, four or five months ago with the last big episode that happened. And I remember just crying and thinking, what am I doing? I can't do anything right. Like if I was a good mom, I wouldn't have like yelled at her. I wouldn't like, I would have been just able to love her through it. Um, even though it was like her actions were really extreme in the things that she was doing. And then I realized that was her call for help, that she had been asking for attention for a really long time and just finally gave up trying to get it and was like, if I'm not going to get it from you that way, then I'm going to do it this way. Um, and, you know, her anxiety was popping up. She didn't feel like she belonged. She didn't feel comfortable with her dad. She didn't feel comfortable with us. She felt like her little brothers had more love. Like all of these things were just really cropping up. She was still sad and grieving from her Gramsci passing away. She was still sad because her brother's dad passed away. Like all of these things. And then COVID. And all of this stuff is coming out in this really ugly way. And instead of being loving with her, I made it even worse. And so I really had to take the time to reset and cry and talk to his counselor and like think like when she acts up like this, I have to start asking her questions because I was there. Like, are you behaving like this because you're hungry? <laughs> are you behaving like this because uh, mommy didn't get up from her computer to acknowledge you when you walked in the door. Do you just want me to step up and cuddle you for a bit? And it was simple little things like that that I learned that. And then like three weeks ago, we were driving and she told me, mommy, I feel loved by you and Ryan. And it was just those little things that when I'm, I do my best to stop working at five now. And that I take time to do that or that I'm taking the time to like, as soon as she walks in the door, I stop everything to let her tell me those stories she needs to tell me. Um, and then doing my best to like pay attention to those little cues, but it's so easy for my first reaction to be anger 
and like impatience with my kids. Um, and then realizing that it all comes from the way I was raised and that the way I was raised wasn't a good way to be raised and to let go of those things that make me think I have to be a certain parent to be a good parent. So I have no simple answer for that except to continue to be gentle with yourself um, because there's so many things going on right now. And that when you do lose your cool and when you yell or whatever happens, to be able to reach out to somebody and talk about those things out loud. Um, I have a friend who just had a major breakdown and, and it took her all day to tell me what she was going through, that she almost hurt her children and she had nobody to back her up. You know, her, no spouse, to nobody. And we're in COVID and who does she turn to? And she was so scared to tell me how she was acting because she didn't want anybody to call social services on her to take her kids away. And so I think as parents and as moms, especially, you know, for us to be able to find somebody to reach out and say things out loud to somebody, um, find that safe space. Like there's tons of virtual um, platforms out there for, for recovery and healing and support groups and stuff. So to like find one that works for you, where you feel like you have some kind of support system to vent and not worry about somebody coming and telling you that you're a horrible mother and that you, your kids shouldn't be with you. Like we're all going through so much right now. And the biggest thing is to just be gentle with yourself, forgive yourself, acknowledge what you've done so that you don't do it again. Because if we don't acknowledge, you know, how we've been acting, it's hard for us to heal it or change it or work through it or transform it. So being able to speak things out loud when you're, you know, after you've experienced something and then forgiving yourself and recommitting to yourself that I'm going to do better the next time this happens, this is how I'm going to deal with it. I think retrains you to, it gets easier every time, but it's just like working out. You know, you're not going to work out a couple of times and be buff. You've got to do it for long periods of time and be consistent. And it's, and it's that practice of doing it. And so you're not going to be like a better parent, you know, overnight. It's going to take every experience to practice working through those things until it just naturally comes to you. Amazing. Should we keep going, Elaine? Um, do you want me to do um, one Got more? I want two more minutes. I wanted to speak into the space that um, everything, all the comments and encouragements and things that you're putting into the space, I promise you that I will forward to Elaine. She will read each of your comments and hear um, through your words the the um, encouragement and and love that you're pouring in. So uh, those are not just from my eyes. I promise to pass them on to to share those um, with Elaine. So two more minutes. Um, when you say if anyone would have jumped in on your journey, they would have stunted your growth. How would you utilize this practice in a child protection profession? Huh, that's not really a two minute question, but. <laughs> um, I have so many things to say about the child protective services and policies and legislation and people thinking like there's there's just so many different reasons for certain things and certain situations and positions um it's just way too much there's just way too much um I completely support communities and nations to assert self-determination and jurisdiction over the decision-making of their own children and um, know that the proper resources need to be put in place for them because right now we're the only province who only has one piece of legislation when it comes to children and families and the policies are crap and people think that they're doing the right thing but they're not and um, that we need to stop getting a quarter of the pie to deliver the same type of services that non-Indigenous uh, departments get to do the same services with half the caseload. So I have a whole bunch of stuff. I, there's no way I could answer that in a way that would be meaningful, but um, I love-based place, love-based place, faith, 
understanding in people's purpose, um, working with people and trusting them. Uh, we're not saviors, you know, we, we don't know, always know what's best. Um, I don't know there it's and I don't know the situations and stuff. There's just I uh, that one's way too big. <laughs> Sorry to toss that in at the last minute. <laughs> I was trying to go chronologically and then it's like, oh no. <clears throat> okay, well, first a huge thank you to Elaine. Um, you're tr we are all truly grateful that you're able to join us and gift us with this workshop and with your knowledge and your heart. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our participants, each of you for joining in this workshop, um, contributing into the space with all of your comments and questions, and for dedicating yourselves to our Moose High campaign cause. Um, the Moose High campaign is inviting all attendees to visit and share about their experiences of the day um, via some shareback sessions that we're hosting with our partner um, evaluation firm, which is called Reciprocal Consulting. So these sessions will occur between 12 p.m. and 5 p.m. Pacific time. Um, so starting in like eight minutes, there'll be a rotation of sessions. Um, and you can find more information about them on the main page of our event website. So event.moosehighcampaign.ca. The first 100 participants to join the shareback sessions will win or receive a free um, Moose High campaign mask. That, um, so that's kind of exciting. Um, and then we, of course, also invite you back to our live stream to join us for the fast breaking ceremony and the calling of witnesses um, at 530 also um, Pacific time. And then the live stream is accessible throughout um, through the event page and through the Facebook Live. And so we really hope to see you there coming back. Mm -hmm.